Oh, oh hi. Hi. Oh. Hello, Adelia. Hi. Hi. Okay, we have one more to invite. Okay, everybody, this is Adelia Khalid. Give it up, man. <laughs> All right. Now, now the next one is new for, uh, Fatin Afrina. Um, let's see how she goes. Okay. Okay. This is so exciting. I can feel it. This is great. This is great. This is great. Yeah. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Oh, hi. Hi. Hi, Fatun I'm Afrina. Hi. Yeah, hi, so today... Hi. hi. <laughs> so today we have both um, Adelia with us and also Fatin Afrina with us. So as you all know, this is our first ever session of Authors Pillow Talk, where authors hang around and just do their thing, you know, just have fun and really get to know about what we as authors really do. Uh, in our work, in our personal lives, I, you know, I think some people like, would like, like to know about us. So today is a very great day over here. How's the day over there? Um, Adelia, I'll ask you first. How's the day? Is it sunny? Yeah, it's super sunny actually. It's kind of hot, which yes. is, you know, not ideal, yeah, yeah. but yeah. It's very you hot know, here it, as well. It hasn't what? been raining for a while, which is nice. Well, and you how about you, do? Fatin? How about you? How's the weather there? Uh, it's, it's quite hot today. Oh, uh, you, yeah. you live, you, Malcolm, you live in Sarawak, is it? I'm in Kuching, yes. Uh, uh, you, Adelia, how, I, how about I you two right now? Where are you guys at right now? Pera. Pera, oh. okay. And then uh, you, Fatin? Selangor. Selangor, okay. <laughs> yeah, today is a hot day, but I love sunny day, so I'm, I'm definitely loving this day today. So, um, okay, actually, so today we'll do some intro background so people know more about who we are, you are. So I'd like to start with perhaps uh, Adelia. Tell us more about yourself, like your background and what we should really know about you. Okay, background. Uh, I'm Adelia. My friends usually call me Yaya. Uh, I come from Sri Manjung Pera and I'm the author of All Minds Are Broken, uh, which is a sci-fi psychological thriller and a number one English fiction best-selling book in MPH. I am currently writing my second book, which will hopefully be coming out soon, uh, hopefully. And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> okay, great. So Adelia is the author of the book, All Minds Are Broken, and it's, it's like the best seller ever. Like I've seen it on MPH, you know, MPH. like Adelia, Adelia, her name is like constantly up there. So yeah, she is one of the best selling authors of All Minds Are Broken. And Fatin, can you also like maybe tell us more about yourself, like your background okay. and things? So, um, my name is Norfa Afrina. Uh, my pen name is NF Afrina, but people can call me Fatin or Afrina, so either way. Um, I'm from Sango. I live in Sango. I'm currently studying medicine. Um, I've been writing since I was um, since I was small, but actually, uh, I've been writing on a notebook. And I haven't written like a real book since after SPM, like Adelia. But unlike Adelia, I didn't actually end up publishing that book. So I'm, I'm very proud of Adelia. I'm actually looking for her book on my shelf, but I can't find it. Yeah, I, I, I'm always looking forward for Adelia's second book. But yeah, about me, I've um, I've written a book and I self-published it in 2000. I think it was 2019 and I'm about to publish it with the same publisher that published Adelia's book. Uh, this year, but it keeps it keeps getting delayed because of MCO, and yeah, I guess that's all about me. Okay, okay, that's interesting. So you guys are both under the same publisher, like both of you, like the same. Yeah, white about white coat, right? Because I did some research. Yeah. It's white coat. Okay, great, great. That's great. Uh, okay, so okay, since you guys are talking about, I'll just talk about myself. I uh, very briefly. Um, yes. I'm the author of the book Diary of a Rich Kid, and. If uh, among of the books I've written in the past, I think Diary of a Rich Kid is my baby. It's my, my favorite book among all because I put a lot of love, investment into it. So I, I, did, I did write other write books as well, but when people say Diary of a Rich Kid, people know that it's me. So yeah. how I came to write about it's another story. And so I would like to move on to um, Adelia. How did you end up becoming a writer? And, and author, how did you end up? What was the kind, what was the kind of stones that you took to be who you are today? 
this question is always like really interesting to answer, but also I might go on a bit of a tangent because I always like loved writing and reading. Like I was the weird kid who brought like a big fat book on Hari Sukan because I I don't like sports. <laughs> I'll just be on the bleachers and be like reading some fat book, and then everyone else is gonna be on the field. And I don't like running. I don't like all that stuff. So I'm gonna be that weird kid who's like reading in the sun. <laughs> so like yeah, reading I'm is always joining you. I'm also on the bleachers as well. I'm at the yeah. bleachers doing this. Yeah, that's like, that makes three of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So like yeah, reading has always been my thing. I love reading, uh, like ever since I was a little girl. And my parents, you know, were always supportive with all the books that they bought, <laughs> and are still buying. Uh, and I started writing when I was really young, like around seven. But like not writing, like serious writing. But you know those exercise books that you buy at uh, Duo Ringgit stores, yeah. where they like buku exercise to do. Yeah, Same I've here. bought Me as well. so many of them, and they're just filled with stories, uh, like princess stories, fantasy stories, like so many uh, that you know probably will never be read by anyone. But they are they are held so close to my heart, and the fact that one of those stories actually got published, you know, means the world to me. And I started when I was like seventeen, when I was thinking, oh, I can actually. You know, publish these stories. You never really think about that kind because you you write for fun, and then you never really think, oh, you know, maybe people are gonna buy this. <laughs> you never really think that. But then I decided, you know what? I'm not just gonna keep these in my bookshelves forever and not let them be read by anyone. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna send these to publishers, and it was a grueling one year of me trying to find publishers because you know it's not really. It's the book industry currently, right? It's not really the best place for like young authors, especially in Malaysia, to get those opportunities. But a friend of mine redirected me to White Coat, and lo and behold, we're here today. <laughs> That's great. You meant uh, earlier on. I would like to go back to what you mentioned earlier on. Uh, you say when you were young, you used to write all those stories. Would you somehow would show it to the world? Because because I actually I wrote a lot. Of stories when I was six or seven years old, and I have pictures all over it. But I kind of like oh, do I want to show it to the world? It's like you know all the ch- childish scribbles and everything. I do, I do still have it in the box. It's like in a box. Would you show it to the world if, let's say, you have a chance I to show it? Bag. It's like a bag of books, bookulop with like stories in them. To be honest, like I would say ninety percent of those stories I will never show to anyone because they're very. <laughs> Sure. They're so embarrassing. I'm not, <laughs> but like maybe if I look back at the stories and like read them and find something that inspires me, maybe I'll I'll make like a different rendition of the story there. Yeah, yeah. Cool. like I always say, never say never. Who knows? Because I at this moment I'm not really like wanting to share my. I mean, I do want to share, but not at this moment. It's not the right time. And how about you, uh, Fatin? What was oh. the thing that led you to become a writer? Um, like Adelia, I also been uh, like a bookworm since I was small, and um, you know when you are when you when you consume books, you feel like you want to be a part of it. Like if they could do it, I could do it too. One second, I need to close my door. Okay. What you say? You can do it. They can do it. I can do it. I'm back. Yes, that's okay. true. So and then um, but but like. Like you guys do, I also wrote in my notebook, and I I used to let my friends uh read them, and then they liked it, but I never really put thought behind um you know being a published writer. I was more focused on posting my books on Wattpad somehow. I don't know. I was young and I was thinking about that, and then when I finally have the courage to find a publisher, um I actually have like a very bad experience with publishers. I wasn't. I wasn't as matured as you, uh, Adelia. I was, I was, I, I had high hopes, and I thought that I thought that um, well, they will welcome in welcome me with open arms. But they ended up, you know, uh, they they didn't want to accept me unless I have like a social media presence. But at that time, I I was a nobody, so it really hurt me, and I did ended up didn't. I I didn't publish that book that I proposed until now, and I've been rewriting it for like five years, so it it was devastating. But then I ended up self-publishing my own book because 
I thought that if I didn't do it, I would get stuck forever. So at least that's progress. So that's that's not like a very pretty story, but that's my story about publishing. Yeah, that, that's good <laughs> what you mentioned because um, I think that um, initially I, I had a publisher, but my publish, publish, publisher was not really well versed in fiction publishing and everything. They're more into academic books. So actually fiction is just a small kind of uh, entity that they do. So eventually I decided to take the rein as I do, I want to self-publish. So Diary of a Rich Kid is actually my first self-published novel. So I took the decision to self-publish. I said, I don't want to hold on because when you feel it's not right for you, then you must really move on and do what you feel is right. Yeah. And okay, now before we go so deep into books and stuff, I know it's going to be very intense, maybe not. I just like just have a bit of icebreaker. Let's do something fun that people want to know about us. So let me ask you, um, maybe Adelia or Fatin, whoever you want to start first. Who is your favorite band or singer? Ooh. <laughs> 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 I actually have an answer already. But it's okay. Can you, you, of you can answer. Uh, can you can, can you see who this is? Tate. <laughs> oh, okay. One of so, the Korean singers. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm a basic, I'm a basic girl. Um, I only listened to like Taylor Swift and I was small because she was a writer too. So she, she, she actually very inspired my writing a lot when I was small because I used to write stories from her songs and I still do until now. So yeah, that's, that's me. I, I like Taylor Swift. I know you like Taylor Swift too, right? Adelia. I want to send you like a digital high five right now. I am such a huge Swifty. Like, I also I also collected uh, the walls. Like, <laughs> that's why you knew. Yeah, and I was like, oh my god! Uh, but I lost mine, which is sad. But I, yeah, I just love like female writer so, singer songwriters, like female singer songwriters who write about you know, really genuine heartbreak and story writing, basically story writing in their songs. So Taylor Swift, really new one is obviously Olivia Rodrigo, huge fan. <laughs> and a lot of like female independent artists like Mitski, uh, Phoebe Bridges. Uh, yeah, just also a lot of like sad music. I like sad music, <laughs> which is not a genre. <laughs> Give me a sad song about heartbreak and I'll probably eat it up. <laughs> basically and I'm a huge musical theater nerd and I love punk rock which is a weird mix but it's my mix it works, <laughs> it works. I, I it used works. to like Taylor Swift I mean I used to listen to the songs I, I, I know why you like her because there was one song I think it's called You Belong With Me oh yeah, yeah like me. so <laughs> I'm from the bleachers something like that I, I really like sitting in the front of the bleachers I mean one all the lyrics it's like I'm from I, do you know that right so, yeah yeah yeah, that, like, so something like that. I, I, I won't say I'm a uh, huge... I love her songs, but I won't say I'm a Swifty. Because when you say you're a Swifty, it means that you are a hardcore fan. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I do change my... Like, I, I also love musicals, like what you mentioned, Adelia. Um, and I currently love this this band. Uh, you know this band, like... Smooth like butter. BBS! Like, <laughs> Okay, I can tell you honestly, I, I, I'm loving them right now, BTS, because previously I don't really listen to their songs because they're singing in Korean, which I don't understand. But at the mm -hmm. moment during this MCO, um, I've been listening to their songs and it was in English and I can understand the lyrics. So I think that's one of the main reasons why I'm loving them, the vibe that they give up as well. So BTS is currently my favorite, but I, I won't call myself an army yet. Not so soon. Maybe as time progress. Yeah. Um, do you have guys have any favorite actor? Or actresses. Mm, I just watched Black Widow, so Florence Pugh is like <laughs> my woman crush of the week. I love Florence Pugh. Or oh, whenever she holds a gun, people call her like Florence Pugh Pugh, which is, is what I call her. I don't know why. I love okay. Florence Pugh. So her acting in Midsoma, Black Widow, just fan good. Her signature frown. You know her signature frown before she. She's such a good actress. I actually don't watch a lot of movies, but I agree about Black Widow. <laughs> okay, okay. The new movie is coming out soon, right? That Black Widow, the the new movie. Uh, out. What is it it's already? already yeah, it's already out. It's so uh, good. I watched. Oh, you watched it? Watch okay. it. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, okay, okay. Uh, how about you, Fatin? What's your favorite? Um, I don't actually watch movies because because I'm you know sometimes uh when you read books you're like uh you're free to imagine it yourself. So when I when I actually have a hard time uh, watching movies, so I don't actually have a favorite actor. But wait, I'll give one. Oh, maybe I'll go with like. Alan Popeyo because I like watching Grey's oh, Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. yeah. I think that yeah. one. I'll go with that one. How about you? I used to watch Grey's Anatomy. I love it. I used to love that. Yeah. It, I mean, it was a long, long series that was back way it's back. Still, so it's still ongoing. It's still ongoing. <laughs> I have to stop watching it because there's too many on Netflix. I I cannot keep up. Uh, I would say my favorite actor is Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad because he is such a good actor. And when Thank I watch you. his performance, I feel so real. Like I can actually feel his feeling, his emotion, is the way he acts as well. So he's my favorite actor. So from Breaking Bad, I'm not sure if you know that that series. I've never yeah, seen it. Very yeah. iconic. Any favorite drama series at the moment? At the moment, a number of them. I I'm that like crazy person who has like so many series that they're currently watching. So whenever people ask me like, "What are you currently watching?" Ah, uh, I just go. Cause there are like ten. <laughs> I'm rewatching like my favorite series. Like I, I'm rewatching High Q and Orange High School Host Club. And at the same time, I just finished Loki. And I'm currently watching like this Emmy nominated series, uh, The Undoing, which is really cool. It's like a therapist who, it's about a therapist played by Nicole Kidman who suddenly finds out that one of the people in her circle was found dead. So it's like a mystery thriller thing. And it's, I've only watched the first episode and it looks good so far. Do you say you watch Loki? Is it worth watching? Would you recommend to everyone to watch Loki? I saw it, but I don't know if I want to watch that yet. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm a huge MCU fan. So like, I feel like if you're a Marvel fan, you kind of have to watch it. But like, the few final episodes are a bit questionable. For me, as someone who who loves Loki, uh, but yeah, but I feel like everyone should at least try and watch it. If it's not your thing, then probably stop by the mid season. But if you're a Marvel fan, you have to watch it, hundred percent. You you have Disney Plus, right? <laughs> Do you have subscribed to Disney Plus? Uh, yeah, newly. Yeah, Just I also I also it. have Disney Plus, but I also have Netflix, so I'm 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 a bit torn. Like I cannot watch everything. I'm not a superhuman. So <laughs> how about you, Fatin? <laughs> Uh, I'm currently watching The Good Doctor. Um, oh. I, I think it's my new favorite because I um, compared to if you compare like Good Doctor and Grey's Anatomy, Good Good Doctor has like less candle and less drama and more of the content. And you know, as a medical student, I, it's really refreshing to watch. You know, uh, how the doctors do it, um, in TV, uh, because they present it in a way that makes you. Even people who don't take medicine, like my family, we, they could watch it, and I, I think it's really cool. Yeah, because Karen, I, what I noticed about the parent during this MCO is that uh, in that on Netflix, the top series are all medical series, like Hospital Playlist, The Good Doctor. Um, there was one medical series. What is it called? Uh, Doctor Strange. I mean, they're all in the top list. So I just feel like during this period, a lot of people are tuning into medical drama series. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> why is the reason? Like COVID, COVID. <laughs> COVID, yeah, it's like not enough COVID. Or maybe they need some kind of like, um, you know, like a feeling of connection because the frontliners, maybe, I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, but I, I, but I think they're trying, I mean, this is from my personal opinion. I think they're trying to somehow emulate um, Grace Anatomy because I feel that Grace Anatomy was really good. It was really good. The way they portray life, death, and everything. So, I don't know. Maybe that, that's just me. Yeah. Um, my favorite drama series is The Crown. Yeah, I know I'm very old school. <laughs> no, no, no. My husband watched that. Yeah, I just love that whole, you know, there's a vibe about it. Like a, I don't know what you call it, but I just... I just love like royal stories story. from the past, yeah, and the drama as well. Uh, favorite song? Okay, maybe you guys have mentioned that. Okay, what's your favorite song? Maybe do you have a particular song that you feel connected with? Yeah. I change my favorite song all the time. <laughs> um, 
Same, I change it all the time. <laughs> you first. You go oh. first. Okay. Uh, wait. Current favorite is probably uh, Me and My Husband by Mitski, which is basically like this melodramatic, like, uh, indie rock song about a, like, wife who's sticking to her husband who is not necessarily the best husband. So it's, it's talking about, like, this toxic household in a way that romanticized and glorified but in a way that's really painful and sad yeah again i like sad songs <laughs> but yeah i think it's a great way to look at relationships in a way that's realistic and also really really sad mitski i love mitski so me okay. and my husband are okay how about you fatin you have all your use you are currently not really having any favorite song oh, in mind okay I think I'm embarrassed to admit it, but my current favorite playlist is, you know, um, the Barbie instrumental one on Spotify. That's my current go-to for now. So I okay, keep that one for now. The, the what? <laughs> you know, I listen to Barbie instrumental because it makes me write faster. I don't know. Barbie instrumental. What is you know, that? Barbie songs, but I found the instrumental version of it on Spotify. Barbie as in Barbie doll, that Barbie... Uh, Barbie movies. The songs are the Barbie movies. The Marvel movies. Barbie. Oh, Barbie. <laughs> oh, okay. I got it. It's from Barbie doll. You mean that that that, that famous Barbie the doll, movies. is it? Okay, yeah. okay. I got it, got it. I was like, when you're saying Barbie instrumental, I was like, yeah. But okay, everybody everybody has different like ways of connecting with song. I mean, yeah. Uh, for yeah. me, uh, my current mood is like uh, I usually change my my songs based on the situation I'm in, and currently there's a song that I really like from Frozen Two. It's called "Do the Right Thing," "Do the Next Right Thing." I I before that song even came about, I I have this uh, personal struggle with like uh, doing. You know, there's a lot of situations like where where we have a lot of things going on around us. Like, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that all at once. But I learned that when you do the next right thing, you take it one step at a time, it really helps in your life tremendously. So that song really spoke to me in volumes. And I really love that song a lot. So that is probably my favorite song at the moment. But I have a lot of songs, but that's one of it that really speaks deep to my heart. So that, you guys know that song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Frozen to <laughs> the next right thing. It's also like it applies to the to our me writing my book. So just take it one step at a time. Do what is the next right thing. Like you know, like you we always have so many ideas and it's just just crazy. Yeah. yeah. Disney okay. song by <laughs> had an Indian rock indie rock. <laughs> Very different taste. I love it. Okay, great. Um, do you guys have a, a favorite book? Ooh. Hard question. Picking from my children. <laughs> uh, very basic answer for literally anyone is the first like go-to book is In Court by Cornelia Funke, which is like the first like, the book I first read. Uh, and it's basically about this girl. It's actually a German book, but it was translated to English after it gained popularity. Uh, it's about this girl who can, whatever she reads, from any book comes to life. And it was like the first like gateway book that got me into reading and when I was like really young. So until now, it holds like a really special place in my heart and I will recommend it to people nonstop. Okay, yes, do you great. have the book? Yeah, wait, where is it? Where is it? It's like, Fung, I know, I, I do have one of his books, but I think Somehow I have too many too many books on my shelf that I, I miss reading that. I, I have the book, one of his books, which I got from Big Bad Wolf. That was one time I got oh. it. Because also, you know, Big Bad Wolf is like so cheap. The bundle is like very cheap. The, the price is so cheap, like slashed all the way. So I got it, but I've got too many books and I kind of miss out on that book. <laughs> yeah. It's really high up on my bookshelf right now. So I might send you like a picture on the, in the end. <laughs> I okay. can't reach it. No problem. Yo, How about you, Fatih? Do you have a favorite book? Uh, my my answer changes all the time, but usually I tell people my favorite book is When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kaliniti and A Thousand Splendid Sons by Khalid Hussaini. Those are safe answers because I've never 
found anyone who doesn't like those two books. But for now, I think my favorite books is the series that I've read. It's called Caravel by Stephanie Garber. Um, it's about like a band, um, like two sisters who, two sisters who lives in this world where there's a car- annual caravel that travels everywhere. But you have to have an invitation to enter the carnival and the competition. And it's really fun. It's three books. And it's all about like um, the other two books are about unraveling who is in charge of the uh, of the magical carnival. I think it's really interesting because I love reading the author's notes, and I think the author's notes in like in carnival is so interesting because the writer actually wrote down everything on a notebook first before typing it. I think it's really sentimental reading it. I know I'm very biased when it comes to authors that you know put their hearts out in author's notes. So yeah, that's yeah. my current favorite. Yeah, I think what you mentioned, what we said is really true because like when you read a book, you have to connect with the voice. Every every author has a different way of writing and you have to feel connected with the voice. My current reading that I'm reading is um, by Adam Silvera. I don't know if you know Adam Silvera. I'm reading his book. I haven't finished yet. Um, I'm reading The Infinity Sun by him. So I think the way he writes it is so, so refreshing. I loved it. Um, it's currently my, one of my favorite books. And previously, I I was trying to read uh, because it was the it was the top drama series on Netflix. Uh, it's called Bridgerton. Bridgerton, The Duke and I. I actually managed to read it, and it yeah, was good. okay. It was okay. It was just okay. But I love. Are you planning to continue the series? Are you planning? I don't to think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's nice, but it's just kind of a bit slow for me. I mean. The yeah. pacing, um, it's okay. It's just that I don't know. I, I, but it's just okay. I won't say it's bad. Yeah, but it was okay for me. Just okay. Yeah. Okay, next one is, do you guys have any favorite villain from the movie? Favorite villain. <laughs> I don't know why, but my head automatically, automatically thinks about the Darkling from Shadow and Bone. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about okay. that too. I don't know, but... He's such a well-written villain because um, you know how villains are sometimes written very sloppily because the writer or the the movie maker or wh- whoever is in charge wants to make people hate the villain. But I think Dark the Darkling is a very well-written villain because you can actually sympathize with him, but not in a way that you deny that he was a horrible person. And yeah, I think that that's what pop up when you when you when you is he the one is he the one wearing the black. Clo- I did watch the 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 you, Risha yeah. thing. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Daniel. The general one. The general one, yeah. General Kirigan. <laughs> How about you, Adelia? Hundred percent would have answered <laughs> the Darkling as well because just putting out he's he's written so complex in a way that you both love to hate him and both love to love him, which is. Yeah you know, very, very, like, so much talent put into that. But I guess if I had to choose another one, it's the Joker. And, yeah, the thing is, with the Joker, and especially when he's written as an antagonist to Batman, is because they're both, like, two sides of the same coin. Like, I, I really like reading about, like, film theory and, you know, literature and film. Uh, and the whole, like, thing about their morality and why they're so interesting to watch is because the whole point of Batman is he doesn't kill anyone. He refuses to enact violence on literally anyone. And the Joker is the complete opposite of that. So like two different like moral philosophies. And when you put them side by side together, it makes you like question your own morality because they're so different. And I think that's really, really cool and why they've been like so iconic up till today. Yeah. Yeah, Joker is, uh, well, I think Joker, I agree with you in some sense. Joker, I think the movie that they shown about a couple of years ago was done well. Although I find it very creepy and very ghoulish. I, but I find that the way they portray his backstory is really realistic and somehow emotionally relatable to everyone in a way. So I think it's really well done. But I just find it very creepy and ghoulish. Um, my favorite villain, I've done, if you know that I've done Mercedes, uh, I've interviewed a lot of mermaids and mermen all around the world. And we can all agree on one thing, is that Ursula from Disney's uh, The Little Mermaid is one of the, the best villain ever. So she has this kind of nice vibe, you know, like 
very I don't know, but we just love her. I think she's also one of my favorite villains. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, and she's also like I don't think she's that bad because she's basically a businesswoman. Like she just stroke a deal, right? <laughs> yeah, a businesswoman. <laughs> yeah, <You're> right. <laughs> How about a favorite hero? A favorite hero from a movie. Um, Wait, what's my favorite? Just think about it. Okay, um, gonna say, yeah. I might go like cliche twenty ten young adult answer. Kenny Sabadine. Honestly, I I love the Hunger Games so much. I was the uh, the kind of uh, person who would like wear like a freaking Mockingjay pin. Like I was a huge Hunger Games fan back in the day, and still now. <laughs> so like, Kenny Sabadine will probably be one of my favorite heroines ever. Love her. Oh, okay, Kenny Sabadine. People love them. How about you, uh, Fatin? Hmm. You should answer first. I I don't know who my favorite hero okay, is I, now. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'll go. I'll go first so that you have time to think about it. Um, I do have a lot of like heroes in my movie, but my hero in the movie I think would be Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad. Even though he is, he he is sort of portrayed as a bad guy, as a villain, but he's also a good guy. So. He struggles with, with a lot of issues in his life, and he he makes a lot of mistakes. But but out of his the deepness of the 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 motive of his heart is to to provide for his family, to to care for his family. So I, I find that me I I find he's a hero. And another hero that I also admire is Harry Potter. Like this mm-hmm. orphan boy from nobody, he suddenly becomes somebody. Um, and I also in a way relate with him. So there. Are, I think those two are like my current heroes, but maybe in in another five years time, I might have another different kind of hero. So it depends on the situation that I am in. Yeah. How about have you finished thinking? Oh yeah, I think I have. <laughs> I'm just gonna go with the easy answer. I think uh, for now, I am very, I am very amazed with the women in Shadow and Bone. Not just the main character, but the thing about um, you know uh, characters written from books is that they carry they carry sort of like the spirit from the book and also what the movie makers do. So there are like two forces in it. So I think my favorite hero from uh, Shadow and Bone is Zoya, but it's not really. I'm I'm not sure if it's a spoiler, but Zoya is actually. I like heroes. Uh, heroes that sort of does not. They don't. Um, they don't uh, succumb to like society's um, idea of being a hero, but at the same time, they're not actually bad. So I like, I think in a way, I like heroes that don't actually fit the frame of what they're supposed to be, and they become more, sort of like that. So yeah, I, I think I, that's what the heroes in Shadow and Bone like portray. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Like mm-hmm. people who are often like the outcast are usually the ones that. Uh, that that shines or grow. I mean, on your personal journey. Um, okay, I relate with that very well. And do you guys have a favorite life quote that that you live by? A strong life quote that you really live by. Yeah. Um, I think mine is like, a ship at harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are for. A ship. In harbor is safe, but, yeah, that's, but not that's, not that's not what ships are for. Because I tend, I tend to like uh, stay in my comfort zone and I don't want to get out. But then I remind myself that that's not what I made for. So it kind of speaks to me. Yeah, because you are the, the the driver of your destiny. You are the sh- the the driver of the vessel, the ship, and just yes, I I love that quote. That is a very nice quote. How about you, Adelia? What is your favorite life quote? I to be honest, I don't like like you know basing my life on that entire like one quote. So, but I really like this one. Yeah, I like this one in Austin. I think it's from Sense and Sensibility, and I'm not sure if the wording is 100% the same. But she basically the general idea is like I'm only as happy as I perceive myself to be. So, in whatever 
situation that you're in and whatever that's happening in your life, there's a possibility for you to be like, hey, I can still be happy. So like, yeah, that has resonated with me for a very long time. Jane you're Austen. Right. Said- you're right. It's about taking control of whether you want to be happy, you want to be sad. If you, you really want to be happy, you have to... Uh, you have to make a declaration, a strong affirmation that you're happy. It's possible. I, sometimes, like, I, I think I've, I've heard about this before. It's like, whatever you say during when you, the, the minute you wake up in the morning is what you become. So let's say in the morning, I wake up and I was like, oh, this day again, you know, I'm so bad day is coming. And then, truth, truthful enough, the bad things will sort of like, you get gloomy. But when you wake up, I'm looking forward to a great day, a sunny day. So when you invite that in, that whole energy will flow with you throughout the day. I believe in that. And um, for me, I also have a, several favorite life quotes, but if I really want to go back to the basics, like whenever I, I sort of gone off the rails a bit, you know, I need to be put back in my, in my space, in my spot, I would just say that live in the present moment, to live in the present moment. Because sometimes when even I go for a job in the park, if I walk in the park, I, I, sometimes my brain will think a lot of things like, what's the future going to be like? And then sometimes my, my, my mind will travel back to the past. So it's, it's like a traffic, like a jamming signal in my brain. So when I take the time to be in a present moment, I start to look at the flowers in the park, the leaves, the trees, and really, really, really take it in, really, really focus on it. It changes everything. It changes everything. So that is very strong. To be living in the present moment, it's, I think, one of the things that we all have sort of, we all need. Yeah. So that is strong. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then the last few questions about uh, the fun facts about yourself, then we move on to books. Um, do you guys have any phobia in your life? Uh. <laughs> I think um, it's a sort of, it's not a phobia, but it's like I have a, uh, I have some, I, I shouldn't say trust issues, but maybe sort of like a protectiveness of my privacy. But at the same time, I want to um, share my writings because I think writing and like sharing your writings are two whole different things. And I struggle with that because sometimes I get so, so scared and terrified of putting myself out there and putting who I am out there. So I kind of have that, you know, that war inside of me. So it's, it's not a phobia, but it's like, it's a very... I think, uh, I think that it's more like vulnerability, uh, vulnerability, like you feel very vulnerable. Yeah, I understand. I got it. Uh, how about you, Adelia? I totally relate to that, 100%. Uh, you know, the feeling of releasing a book that you just so had on and then like having the world just have any ability to do whatever they want with it. So that's scary. And, but uh, yeah, that that one, I think all of us can relate to at some extent. And, but I guess I'll go with like a cliche one. I'm scared of heights, 100%. And (laughs) I guess like a very fun, not very fun fact about me is that I get kind of, I get like uneasy feelings on bridges. Any bridge, I think, oh no. (laughs) <laughs> like bridges are scary because you you have to like believe in the bridge <laughs> and i you don't, don't know why you don't trust in, the bridge i don't trust the bridge <laughs> yeah <laughs> i, I just have to <laughs> I, have, I have friends like you as well they, they are afraid of heights when they look they look down they, they start to hy- hy- hyperventilate they start to like oh i, I do I, I do know people like that yeah it, it's a real thing it's a real thing yeah for me, yeah. um, I would thank God that I don't have fear of heights. I'm okay with heights. But what I fear is that, like, probably it's a child, childhood kind of thing to be in the wide open ocean and then thinking mm-hmm. there's sharks, like, below trying to eat you up. That's really childish, uh, like, phobia. But, I mean, when people ask me, I'll tell them that, you know. But basically, I don't think I really have that phobia anymore. Probably kind of outgrew it. I tend to embrace the open sea, the ocean. And I think once... To, to overcome your fear, you have to face your fears. So um, I went snorkeling in the open ocean before. So I kind of think that the ocean is a beautiful place. So that fear mm-hmm. sort of dissipated, like, oh, go, went away. Yeah. That's a word for like, your phobia. Is it, is it thalassophobia? Is it? Yeah, that's the word. Yeah. It's, it's, a val- it's a very valid fear. 
I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think the the main uh, culprit of that would be the movie Jaws when I was watching Oz Young. You know, like da -da -da -da, and it's like you start going crazy. But it's okay. I'm okay. I'm already over that. But I still have a bit a missed childhood related. Um, okay, now let's go into your books. Okay, can you tell Adila? Maybe we we'll start with Adila first. Uh, can you tell us more about the first book that you wrote, The All Minds Are Broken? What was the experience like? How did you feel at that moment you wrote this book? Yeah. Okay, so I think it started off like any other book, like book, any other story that I've written is because I just started writing for fun. And then I, I thought, hey, I think there's some kind of potential with this story. I need to go find like a way to get that published. And I... I spent like months researching how to do it and uh, found like different sources, different traditional publishers in Malaysia because at the current time I was 17, I think. So yeah, I was 17. I was a minor. So there were a lot of like legal framework that would get complicated if I would want to, you know, self-publish or if I wanted to find like an international publisher. So it was traditional publisher locally based in Malaysia or nothing. And the actual process of writing the book was fun. I love writing. So yeah, and it got, it was mostly like my teenage angst put into a book because I was going through some things, you know, teenage life, uh, teenage drama, things like that. And like the certain issues that I was going through, it was all like put into a book, all my emotions. And yeah, it was a good outlet for me. And now that we're here, it's, even like a great outlet for my creativity. It was amazing. I love it. Okay. And then speaking of that, um, the, the story and the premise of All Minds Are Broken, you, it's, from what I read, it's like a psychological thriller. So did you actually love to write thrillers? Or I mean, how did that whole concept come about? Like, okay, I'm going to write thriller. This is what I'm going to do. Like, you know, not, not romance, not... How, how did it come about, that whole concept? We're all curious about I it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a big person on romance. Uh, like I do read contemporary romance sometimes, but it doesn't really like suit my fancy. I I don't really know why, but I really like the kind of books that you know are set in a different world or set in the future, like dystopians, fantasy, sci-fi. It has like an element of escapism and like you kind of don't really know where the author is going sometimes. Like in a romance, you know that they have limits because it's set in the real world. It's basically the biggest like conflict is person A can't get person B or like person B doesn't tell person B that, oh, I, I actually like you. It's always like some kind of misunderstanding. And although those are really fun to read, they're not really like my favorite thing to read or write about. And it's always been like interesting worlds and interesting concepts. And the whole point of All Minds Are Broken was that it was actually, it started out as a sci-fi. It's still a sci-fi, but it slowly became some kind of thriller because of the conflicts that were implemented in the plot. So it became like a sci-fi thriller. So yeah, and I guess the thriller part wasn't exactly planned, but the sci-fi was definitely 100% because I love different worlds. And my second book is going to be a fantasy. So fantasy, sci-fi, young adult, three of my favorite genres ever. You know, you know what? I actually agree with you. You, me you mentioned that initially you write it as a sci-fi book, but eventually you kind of didn't expect it to be a thriller. The same goes for me. When I was writing my third book uh, about the sea, I didn't <laughs> even know that I was going to write about mermaids. No yeah. idea. It just came. It just came spontaneously. So it became a fantasy kind of thing. It just came because because it just came. The idea came to me. Wow, you know, because the story was about the pandemic and they're trying to escape the world. Like everybody is suffering and everything. So they say, okay, we have a submarine. Let's go on a vacation under the sea. Go with social distancing as far away from everybody from Earth as possible. So they they are rich. They are able to buy a submarine. Uh, and then they had a very luxury submarine with a swimming pool inside, everything went under the sea. And then there's something under the sea. I don't know how the mermaid body came. So I really relate with you in that, in that sense. Um, Fatin, how about you? Tell us about your book, Inkling, that you wrote. How did the whole concept come about? What was the idea that drove that book? Um, I think 
I think I agree with you, uh, you guys, because sometimes the story wants to write itself. We have we have an idea of it, and then suddenly when you write it, the char- the character wants to tell its own story. And sometimes I think it's a very magical feeling when it comes to books, writing books. Um, I think when it comes to inkling, it's not actually a planned, um, conscious act of writing a book because uh, there are actually um, short stories that I managed to find. Um, I I. I actually write the whole time when I was busy taking international baccalaureate and can be, but I wrote the stories, but I've been, I've, how to say this? I've always been, um, I, my friends always say that I overthink everything and I tend to put everything to metaphors. So I kind of think that what if I could turn these metaphors into stories? So that's what, that's what happened with Inkling. I was actually very scared to share Inkling with the world because I thought that nobody would get the book. So nobody would get the message. So in a way, um, Inkling is sort of my way of saying it's okay if the people don't, um, not everyone gets what I mean because I only write for the people who will actually get the message behind the book. So sort of inkling is sort of my way of assuring myself instead of a book that I plan to put out there for me. Okay, just to put this into context, like like Adelia, she wrote All Minds Are Broken. Um, she, she is doing sci-fi trailer. So so the, the audience who read the book is like wants to feel the, you know, the trail. But for your book, inkling, what kind of what, what what are the stories? What are the elements that you hope that readers will get from it? What is the kind of uh, ramifica- ramifications do you hope that people will take away from this book? Yeah. So for inkling, uh, it's sort of a sorted, um, a very um, a very vast mix of themes. But most of the time, my theme is more to f- fantasy or magical realism because I tend to gravitate what's those kind of writings when I read books. So I think my target audience is people like me who find who like to read books, but at the same time, they get stuck at details and metaphors at the sides. So I guess that's my target o- uh, audience. Um, it's sort of like an escape, like a fantasy or sci-fi world, but in, in, the, in terms of words and paragraphs. Because I know, I know myself and a lot, some people who actually adore metaphors and like to overthink things. So that's, I guess that's my target audience. Okay. So I, so I know it's in story form. Would you compare your book in a way somehow similar to Langley of the, the, the poetry girl in a way? I don't know. Would you but, um, draw if... parallels to that? Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I think uh, when... I try, I I try to write poetry, but I don't have the patience to actually put everything in like lines and, um, you know, rhymes. So that's why I write stories because I don't have the patience. But if I end up end up like being compared to her, maybe one day we don't know. I would feel very happy and accomplished. I don't know. Okay. But yeah. The next question. The next question is very important because this is the first thing that people see when they look at your book your book title. Now, uh, maybe I'll start with, okay, maybe Fatin, then Adelia. How did you come mm-hmm. about choosing that name, Inkling, for your book? Okay. What inspired so, you to choose that name? Actually, yeah. I could tell you about like the whole cover thing. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> um, Inkling actually means like a bit of something. So in a way, um, the short stories are actually a bit, a few bits from my life that I turned into stories. So I could actually share pieces of myself without actually sharing myself. Because, you know, I ha- I said that I had like, like the fear of putting myself out there. So the stories have been um, thought and spun into like wholly different things, but carry the same message that I want to carry as a person and like it matches with the with the drawing actually the drawing is called a one line drawing uh because it's all made in one line i don't remember the reason i did but that was the reason why i did it and it make it 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 connects with the word inkling i think it's because the it's one line but you could make like a whole picture so yeah yeah i get it it's the inkling of everything it's like uh, yeah. bits and pieces of everything yeah, that's a very yeah. nice name and okay now to you Adelia when I saw that name All Minds Are Broken I, my first in, maybe I'm just very a literal person I'm, I'm starting thinking brains are all broken spattering <laughs> the pieces 
But I know it's not that. It's, tough, it's probably very metaphorical. So how did you come about with that name? All minds are broken. Yeah. Okay. It's very cool. So actually, <laughs> my journey, <laughs> yeah, the title was kind of complicated because when I started writing it, the first draft, it was called like, the perception of reality or something. I don't know, something weird like that. And then it changed to sleepless, which kind of ran with the theme of, you know, five people can't like, like meet each other in their dreams. So sleepless. But sleepless is like the title of so many books already. If you Google sleepless, it's like so many books have the same title and it would be like really, you know, not the greatest move marketing wise, I guess, to have so many books of the same title. So I looked through the book uh, for like a certain quote that I like that, you know, was important to the plot. And I found All Minds Are Broken. And right exactly at that time, I was reading A Hard and Heavy Thing by Maddie Haig, which is like a war crime story. Uh, so basically, A Hard and Heavy Thing is the title. But on the book, you have like this word art with. I probably need to go get it so that you guys understand it more. All right. Yeah. Wow, okay, not Matt. the back of your, the, the shelves, you have a lot of books. Like, I've seen it just not from the beginning. There's a lot of books behind the shelf. Like a whole... Yeah, okay, okay, Adelia, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, so we have this. So we have like that. So it's like a hard and heavy thing, but it's written war here. So oh, okay. I thought it was really... I thought that was really, really cool. Like how you can take like just the lettering and have it say something else. Okay. So, yeah. So, when I found All Minds Are Broken as a quote, I was like, that's going to be cool if I incorporate that somehow. So, I was like, oh, All Minds Are Broken, and then she answers Liar. And it just so happened, like a huge coincidence, that you could find Liar in the yeah, phrase. Yeah. So, I was like, we need to do that. So, I sent like the uh, prototype cover art because I did a lot of graphic design and commission work when I was like in secondary school so I already had like that that kind of like artistic background so I sent it to White Coat and we worked together to get this so that's cool wow. so that became creative wow so it really took a lot of planning in, in the way of the structure how the the uh, typography everything comes into place I think that's very creative that's very creative yeah, yeah. for like like for people they really need to really sort of uh, really see the the whole design to able to see the word liar yeah it's like for people who are very busy you know like they, they're very like on and on with their daily lives i don't think they will be able to catch that but i think for those people who are into books literature and everything i think they'll be able to make up that word so i think that's very creative not a lot of people are doing that yeah I, okay so i'll tell just a, I'll tell a bit about my my book Diary of a rich kid how i came up with the title um, Dive for a Rich Kid, uh, initially I want to call it the Journal of a Rich Boy. Then I, Journal of a Rich Boy sounds like, when you say boy, it sounds like this book is only for boys. I want it to be for both boys and girls. So I try not to be very uh, gender focused, like boy. So I just, I need some pronoun that is, can be both, for both boys and girls, unisexual. So I decided to kind of like diary, maybe Journal of a Rich, I don't know then, Rich kid seems very, very, the lingo sounds very, very easy on the ears. Rich kid, rich kid. But when I say journal of a rich kid, it sounds very scientific, like journal. Then, mm. then you know, I, I, I really had a lot of, uh, I was really, I had a lot of thinking about it. Like, diary for, di journal or diary. And then there was, in the market, there was one called diary for a wimpy kid. So I was kind of afraid that people would, like, draw parallels to that. But, but what I, from my gut, I just felt that Diary of a Rich Kid sounds more natural and people can relate to it. Yeah. So eventually the whole name became Diary of a Rich Kid. I said, okay, just go with it. You know, just go with it. If let's say in the future I need to change my name, I need to rename it to something different, I might do that. But I went with my gut. So it's just that's how it became um, that. Yeah. And I also what what I want to go back to what you were saying earlier on, Adelia, you mentioned that you wrote the book for fun. Do you know that when I wrote Derek Rich Kid, I also wrote it for fun. I never wrote it for audiences in mind. I didn't think like, oh, I'm going to write for this person. I'm going to write for, for this person. I just, that was the time I was like kind of stressed out. Um, I found that writing this was very cathartic for me. 
So I yeah. just wrote and wrote and wrote. And when it finished, I thought, hmm, maybe it can be published, you know. So it, it was just for fun, just for myself. Yeah, so I kind of relate with what you, you say about that, like writing for, for yourself. Sometimes people write it for, when they write it, they think of the audience, like, you mm -hmm. know, but when you write it from your heart, from your own space, it, it sounds very different. The voice, especially the voice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the next question I want to ask is, this one happens to every one of us. Every single one of us, no denying that. What do you do when you have writer's block? What do you do? Anyone that you can, anyone, <laughs> once you're ready to answer. This question hits hard because... <laughs> <laughs> <Hello>. Exactly. <laughs> oh, you don't have writer's block. You guys can write with ease. If no. you, you can do that, I salute you. I totally salute you. <laughs> Definitely not. I guess for me, I, I always like say the same thing. It's even like a reading slump or like an art block or anything because I really like, you know, doing all the creative things. So like you always have like that one mood where you don't want to do it. And that applies to literally anything. And the thing is, when you don't want to do something, it's just your body and your brain saying, I don't want to do it. So you don't do it. Yeah. That's, I don't ever feel like I need to force myself to write because it just means that I don't want to write at that certain time. And why do then I go back to why I want to write in the first place. It's because I feel inspired. So I need to go read a book. I need to go watch a movie. I need to go do something. I need to go like live my life. So like go live your life and then life will hopefully give something back to you. And then you write. Yeah, you're right. I agree. How about you, Fatin? What do you do? <laughs> You I'll also follow the same route as as Adelia, or um, I'm I I like to take Adelia's step <laughs> because um, <laughs> what I do is just I set a timer on myself for like five minutes and then <laughs> because sometimes um like like Adelia said like it's it's all in your head so when you actually sit down and write you just remember how much you love writing and you just write it's actually just yeah. you just want to get over that friction of the fear of wanting to write even though you already love writing so it's just you have to like i usually i just just force myself to sit down and set a timer that's that's what i do yeah for <laughs> me when i i when i write and I, I kind of like stumble upon a rock i cannot i cannot move on i would not sort of sit there and sort of like ah go on welcome go on you know i won't like sit there and force myself and torture myself i'll say okay this is probably um some telling you a voice telling you to stop you should do something else. So I would just, like what Adelia, go watch a movie, watch Netflix, Disney Plus, whatever, or go for a walk in the park. And sometimes I need to go out as well. Like I go out to check things out at the shop, at the mall, or go to the park. So all this, even this thing doesn't seem very uh, significant, but like when you go for a walk in the park, even small steps can lead to, you know, it can really help be your muse as well. So you saw, it's telling you you need to recharge. You need to take a break. You know, so I guess we always have, we, because we, we know our own body, whether we can, you know, so I think it's very important to listen to your own inner voice. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. And then the next question I want to ask is, um, as an author, do you guys face any challenges? Like, is there anything that makes it hard to be a writer or is there any stumping blocks that is in your path? Okay, maybe we start with Adelia first. Okay, of course, I think I'm just gonna like rehash about the whole like publishing process, especially in Malaysia and trying to publish in English book. Uh, remember when I said like I had my publishing process was like a whole year because I couldn't find anyone who was going to accept my manuscript. But every single time, what frustrated me the most was the reasons why my book wasn't getting published was not because it wasn't good. Like I, I'm not saying that it's perfect or anything, but the responses that I got specifically were saying that the book was not going to be marketable because of its language, because of its genre. So that kind of irked me and kind of disappointed me, but I understood. But I, I wasn't going to change the story just for the sake of making it marketable or like just for the sake of publishers getting it because I read I wrote it for fun and 
I was just like, if it's not going to get published, it's not going to get published. And I was young at the time. So I was like, it's, it's not going to be the end of the world if I don't get a book published. But it was always a dream of mine. So I just kept on trying. And then there was like a, there was like a point where I decided to give up because I'm not going to put out the name of the publisher, but the publisher essentially replied to my manuscript submission with a whole essay talking about how the book industry in Malaysia was dying and that they would only accept people who already have a social platform. So they asked me for my like Instagram follower count, their Twitter, Instagram count, my age and my like networking, what I was currently working as. And I answered, I, I have no, I'll have like 100 followers and I uh, am in secondary school. And then they just went dream on basically. <laughs> so I gave up for a few months essentially uh thinking that it was never going to happen and then again a friend redirected me to white coat and i'm so grateful that they're giving a lot of opportunities to young people who want to write and want their books to be put out there so yeah really really grateful that's great that's great that's really great to hear i mean i wish when i was 18 years old i wish there was, there was white coat in my life <laughs> when i was 18 years old <laughs> yeah it's great i mean sometimes Things like that happen is uh is a great like you know it's um opportunity meaning the right moment so you 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 actually met the right moment so it's always about the timing and for you Fatin what 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 was the challenges that you faced is it something similar to Adelia or you had a different kind of um, thing going on with you at that time I think I think I know what publisher Adelia approached because I had the same exact experience except that I actually went to the publisher um, to see them myself and so the the rejection was like first hand and oh, that's I, it okay. now I shouldn't have let it consume me but I did so yeah I think I share the same challenges as Adelia and she already said what what how hurtful it was but yeah I think I think that's why like a lot of um, Malaysian choose to self-publish because even when we publish with like um, local publishers, there's, they're not as big as um, international publishers. It's, you could probably have the same level of marketing by self-publishing. So it's sort of either, yeah, I, I can't talk yeah, about I, I, I get it, I get it. Because uh, like, like, like you say, local publishers, like I also faced rejection when I was young. Um, like I did submit my, my manuscript and you get those automated rejections and you know, you just get feel like dragged down. I felt that uh, a couple of times. So actually, I was very um, elated when one of the local publishing companies offered me uh, a chance to write for children. And I jumped at that. That was about 10 years ago. That's how I came out writing Zany Zombie. That was my first published children's book because of this local company. I, actually, I was very happy because I said, oh, somebody's going to send me that. You know, I'm so happy. I'm so, I'm so over the moon. So um, actually, I wrote about four books, five books for them. And and then they, it was in the market for a couple of years, but I do realize that this company I'm not going to name I'm not going to name names okay so out of uh, respect for them, um, I don't think they are very strong in fiction marketing but they're very strong in I would say academic books, textbooks mm -hmm. because they are really education focused so they don't really give so much time and so much commitment to fiction mm -hmm. so when when my books out. I was I actually reached out to the marketing and said, "Oh, can we just do on a road show more often?" Like you know, they, they did it in the beginning, but I've, the whole momentum sort of dwindled as time goes by, and I don't feel like they really want to commit so much to that because they, after all, are academic publishing company and they're more focused on going to schools, selling textbooks and stuff. So um, it wasn't the right call for me, and of course, I I was glad for the experience. So eventually, that was like a bit of challenge for me, but. Uh, and I took a hiatus for maybe a couple of years. I stopped writing. I was like, oh, there's too many things already. And then I suddenly heard someone telling me very strongly. I heard from someone saying that, um, if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? Because we only have a certain amount of life on earth, a lifespan. Like seven, we can live until maybe 70, 80, 90, you know, we don't live until 1,000 years old, like Edward Cullen from Twilight. So... <laughs> So that really hit me very strongly. And I said, oh my God, that's right. I only have one, one shot in life. So I decided that one shot in life, if I really want to do my, the things I want to do, that's to have my own book. 
So I decided to write Die for a Rich Kid. I wrote it. I was like writing all over like crazy. I just love writing. I didn't, I didn't care. Then when I realized that it was a good material to publish, uh, instead of looking for a publisher, I did, I think, I think I didn't really look, actively look for a publisher because I know how hard it is to find a fiction publisher in Malaysia. I decided to take my own reins and I decided to self-publish. So if, if, so you always have to find a way. So, so I was very, uh, I took this initiative to self-publish and it finally, it was fruitful, I, I guess. And it, it led to a lot of great moments for me. So I, I so the whole thing is that um, I always believe that that you always have to do it. If I was to sit there and wait for somebody to you know to lift me up, you know, I think it will not happen. So I have to do it. I have to take my own initiative, and I have to say I have to self-publish. So if I don't say I want to self-publish, then that moment would never come, and I probably would still not having my books out yet. Probably not in the market. So I'm glad I made that call, and I'm glad I did it. So. That was how I overcame the challenges that was thrown in my in my spot. Yeah, that was a really really uh, enlightening moment for me. Something that I can really learn. So I hope that the same goes for you guys. You guys also have great success stories like Adelia, which I love that you came to the right moment that White Coat decided. You know, and then but then you also decided to self-publish which is a good thing, you decided to make your own call. So you always have to do something. You cannot just wait and wait. So I think that is, speaks true for all of us. Um, the next question I want to ask is, what are your upcoming books? Do you have any in, any in, in the works? Maybe we start with Fatin. Oh, I, I'm actually write, rewriting the book that I tried to send to the publisher, but... You know how I said that some stories, they want to write themselves? I think in a way, the reason that this story haven't, hasn't gone out, yet, gone out yet, despite me having like kept it for a few years, is because it, 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 it was missing something. So I'm rewriting it and adding like things that I love. And I'm not just thinking about what people would love. I almost, I'm also taking account of myself. So I'm rewriting it and adding like, um, elements of fantasy and magical realism so it's sort of like a building up what I have from the past so that's what I'm currently working on and it's it's getting close but I'm taking I'm taking my time but I actually don't have a lot of time because I can only write during um, my summer break because I'm taking medicine so I won't be able to write later but I hope I get to finish everything by by next month that's great that's great how about you Adelia any any more psychological thrillers? She's right. Oh. <laughs> are you are you okay. writing on your second book right now? I, I mean, you're working right. Uh, from what I heard just now, you said you're doing. I'm working right now. Uh, and like some other projects on the back burner. Probably not gonna touch those in years, probably. But right now, I'm currently writing my second book, and because I'm technically like not doing anything right now other than that because I'm waiting for my UPU results so that I can continue for my degree hopefully in English literature pray for me <laughs> uh, yeah so I'm working on that which is a fantasy retelling of different Malay and Malaysian folklore so like Tanggang, Bawang Putih, Bawang Merah, uh, Badang, things like that hashed together into a whole like mashup uh, but in a more like epic fantasy young adult type of thing. So we'll see how that goes. It's technically done, but I need to do more editing. So really excited about that. Okay. Like so, so it'll also be published under White Coat or? Yeah. For the time being, yeah, the plan is that. Okay. Great, great. Okay. Um, okay. I would say, okay, my next question would be, um, okay, do, currently, when we always talk about books, right, we always think that the book from the West is better than local books. Because I think we grew up with not much choices from local authors. So, like, all the books that come, come is from, like, from other countries. Like, you know, like, like Shadow and Bones is from, I think, from US. Uh, Harry Potter is from UK. Uh, all these books, all this, all this flooding our market is all from the West. And our local books is very underwhelming. The, 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 the uh, the authors here is very underwhelming. Now, why do you think until this day, like now we're living in 2021, I, will, I would think that would probably be as, you know, as big as those right now, but we have not really seen so much of that. 
why do you think the works from local authors are very underwhelming at this moment? And what do you think we can do to actually elevate that? How do, maybe we start with um, Adelia. Okay, so interestingly, I actually wrote like a, a speech or like more of like a, an essay, like thesis for my foundation studies uh, on this particular subject, on why local books are not regarded in, you know, in such a high regard as compared to books published in the West. It's because we've, most of us, you know, especially when it comes to English, because in Malaysia, English is a second language. It's not the number one thing you think of when books are being published in a certain country. And not only that, we essentially have the underlying idea, probably due to like, you know, roots of colonialism, <laughs> if we're going to get deep there. But, you know, we have the idea that movies from the West have more ratings, have more like international appeal. So it's just like very psychological where people think, oh, this movie is going to be better because it has a higher budget. It's a worldly renown. And this one is only local. So no one is going to immediately think that it's going to be better. But those are things that, you know, we live with, like, it's a prejudice thing. But I think it's going, it's getting better. Because there are, I think, a lot of young people who are rising up to, you know, getting their works written. And I actually get a lot of DMs from really young people, like secondary school, uh, primary school, asking me how I got my book published and wanting to become writers. And I think that's really, you know, I, it's giving me a lot of hope. And, you know, Malaysians who are getting published by international publishers like Hana Alkaf with The Weight of Our Sky or uh, Zen Cho with Blackwater Sister, uh, books like that are going to give Malaysia a more, you know, bigger representation in, like, on an international basis. And therefore giving more encouragement for the local scene to be as, you know, active with publication, with writing, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I personally think that one of the reasons, like, okay, when I was, I was the kid from the 90s, so for, during that, that, that my time, my, my time um, when I grew up, um, there was not a lot of local authors. The, the one that was very popular was, like, True Singapore Stories. Uh, ghost story, mm -hmm. something like that, by Russell Lee. And even Russell Lee, I, I heard, is not actually from Singapore. It's from, from a Western country who like mm -hmm. sort of migrated to Singapore and become a citizen there. So it's not really like a local, local person. Right? So those people were like the ones that we kind of look up to and they were not local, but they were uh, packaged or marketed as local people like Russell Lee, the, the author of True Singapore Ghost Stories. And yeah, when I got thinking of that, we really don't have that much, but now... We have people like <clears throat> Adila Khaled. We have people like Fatin. We have people like Malcolm Ajay. You know, we are, I think what we, the things we're doing right now is very, very significant, very important. We are building that foundation and the stepping stone to sort of path, path the way for local authors to have. So I, I realized during this moment, we, we have a lot of like, if you compare it to 10 years ago or a decade ago, there is not so much of that. But now there's so much news of local authors uh, in the in the writing scene, which is a good thing. So I think we're making progress, but it's probably not as fast as we would like. But as long as we lay that foundation and we show, and I think another thing is that is really, really uh, concerning is that um, because of the culture that we have in Malaysia, we are more focused on science, math, you know, like people don't say, oh, you're going to write a book. People don't usually clap their hand and say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to write. Even when I was writing, people were saying, what, you want to have a writer? Because writing does not make money. You know, people are always, the culture around here in people's like science, you know. So I guess because of that, of the, that kind of um, microscope that we're living under, I think it really affected that culture as well. So in Western countries, they're more open. It's like, oh, you're writing it? That's great. You know, so there's that sense of encouragement that that, that culture is there. So I guess because we live in different cultures, but now I can see a shift, a paradigm shift in our culture right now, so which is a good thing. Um, okay, I want to move on to this before we move on to the next uh, section. Uh, I think, Fatin, you mentioned about you wanting to tackle the issue about publishing, which is uh, the local publishing industry and also the international public industry. So, so what do you think um, makes our local industry, publishing industry, 
different from self-publishing to publishing internationally. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think uh, when it comes to uh, um, local publishers, Malaysian publishers, they're really very, very small compared to international publishers. Because, um, okay, so uh, international publishers, uh, the way they market their books is that they actually connect with um, book content creators and then they make like book tours. They have campaigns building up to pre-orders of the books and their marketing strategy is very strong and they are very competitive because there there's basically a lot of um companies uh, internationally but compared to like um local publishers there there's actually there's not a lot of publishers that actually you know um publish fictional books so they don't think they have competition and that kind of makes them complacent in a way so they're not that up to date when it comes to marketing because I've been in the bookstagram community and I know how very effective um, your word of mouth when, when it comes to uh, books and I think it's very it's a loss that uh, local publishers that they think that just by you know having sales and just having the books in bookstores actually sells the book because it's sort of in a way being complacent and I think that's like the, a very jarring comparison just other than you know other than knowing that international publishers have like a bigger reach compared to local publishers I think it's more about I think what I want to point out, point out is about the marketing because marketing really matters um, in um, publishing because yeah you like, like you know like Malcolm you are yourself publisher right there and marketing yeah. is very important I think local publishers like that by a lot and I, yes yeah i hope they could improve I, that totally. because it's very sad I, as a writer yeah. because we put our all in the books right? yeah so i totally agree with that out. i so so agree with that um i, yeah. I want to say, point out also um those like published like okay like hannah alkaf the way of our sky she was published under i think simon schuster simon schuster is the biggest publishing company one of the biggest company the big five in the world they have strong yeah. marketing budget they are able to sort of uh, give free, like a lot of f uh, free physical physical review copies to people around the world because they have strong marketing budget. I do give physical review copies, but I have limited because I'm self-published. So if, yeah. if I were to give every single person a physical copy, I, I will probably you just, won't. yeah, I will just die as a, an author. I can't, I, I have to fit myself as well. So, and also they have very strong marketing, uh, they have network everywhere. So compared with people who have this kind of advantage, compared to us self-published authors, we don't yeah. have it, we need to do our own. And what we ask from return is that um, they, they give an honest opinion of our, our works. And to be honest with you, when I reach out to people to do reviews, I don't force them. If they say they don't want to do it, I immediately say, that's fine. I don't force people. What in return I ask is that you give an honest review and also um, you also enjoy the book as well. You get a free free book, ebook, and you get to promote it on your platform because some of them I see that they don't have a lot of content on their Instagram and they even spend money to buy it just to fuel the content on, on their Instagram. They buy the ebooks, they buy the Kindle, they buy it. So so what I can do as a small portion is as a you know, just make sure that like honest honest review and if you can't you don't do it i won't force you i never force yeah. people to do it because i believe that when i reach out people they do it from from the passion of as a, as a bookstagrammer as a reader so if you love reading and you really enjoy it without any complaints i'm so happy that and you're also even su supporting local authors so that's great yeah i just point that out and i don't force people when they say i can do it i don't go and say oh please you know i don't i say i respect that immediately i say i respect that you know so i i'm really really respectful to everybody that I um, I do it as review. And um, another thing uh, I want to mention is that, yeah, I agree, international publishers, if you get them, you're like hitting the jackpot. You yeah. know, they do the marketing for you, everything. So yeah, so I'm hoping one day I'm also able to find an international publisher so that I can just not do all the marketing anymore. <laughs> I can just sit down yeah. and just chill and watch my Netflix. Oh, that would be so awesome. Yeah. And right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, before we move on, this is very, very important. I want to, I want to say, um, have any of you received criticism for your book? 
And if you have received criticism for your book, what are the criticisms? And maybe you like to share. Maybe Adelia. Yeah. Uh, maybe Fatin will go first. I kind of need to like uh, refresh my mind on this one. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, nice. Fatin, have you ever received any criticism or no? Everything is like no. rainbows <laughs> yes. and, and roses, uh, you know. Everything no. is... No. <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest criticism for like my book is that people not getting it. <laughs> people not getting what I was trying to say and it used it used to like affect me because I think that it was a reflection of um me not doing enough in a way yes there's like room to improve but it also made me realize that everyone I cannot have the whole world as my target audience I I, I will keep improving but it sort of give me like the impression that I'm not writing for everyone. I'm writing for myself first and then for other people. But yeah, other than people not getting uh, my 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 work is that I think it's more to like errors, <laughs> errors and spelling grammar errors because I didn't have an editor. I was I, I self-publish it for fun. So yeah, I think those are the like the most frequent criticism about my books. Okay, great, great. That's that's good. How about you, Adelia? Or you still need yeah. everything? Uh, yeah, I think I got it now. Uh, <laughs> basically, uh, the most like criticisms that I get, one are like uh, not spelling errors, but more like editing, like editing little things. I did have an editor, but uh, there were like two things that were missed out. And for some reason, uh, it was very like, seen oh. like people pointed it out like two just like two points in the book and after it was like printed out people saw it and yeah that one definitely going to keep in mind <laughs> for the second book and uh people also think that it has a lot of plot it's because i think it was a point in my life where things were really complicated around me so the story was going to be like slightly complicated. It has like five point of views. So that was one thing that was definitely something that not a lot of people could enjoy. And it was very plot di driven rather than character driven. But those are kind of like the books that I like to read are like that. So I stuck with my kind of preference, my kind of taste. And there were people who really, really liked it. And there were people who just couldn't vibe with it. And I totally get that. So yeah. That part probably not going to change about my writing because it's just how I like to write. Yeah, and one more thing that I got was the ending was a bit dissatisfying, but I guess I can't really put out the ending of my book here. So <laughs> oh, okay, okay, great. Uh, yeah, I think I also I also have a lot of people commenting my book as well. They are actually both equal love and hate for my book, like. A lot of people love it, some people also hate it. So I agree that those people who comment that will like nitpick on like your spelling error, grammatical error, and all those all those stuff. But I will say that if 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 you have one single grammatical error or spelling error, I'll just say that that is your like your work with pride because that is your first battle scar, you know what I mean? It's like you created this baby from hardship from your labor, you should be proud of it. So I, I don't think that um, nobody should talk down on, on, on that because after all, you, we are self-published and we, we did a lot of effort. So no one is perfect. The whole, the whole core of this is that no one is perfect. And I do get a lot of some criticism and co constructive criticism on my book. I also, have, I also have good ones, which I'm very, very happy with. Wow, they love that. There was, one, there was one time I was doing book signing in, in one of the bookstores and one lady, she, she came to, to me and she saw my book. And then I said, oh, are you, she had, I think she had a son, a young, a young son or a daughter. And she was like saying at, to me, said, do I have a rich kid? And I said, yeah, would, you, would your child love this kind of book? It's, it's all about adventure, fantasy, and action adventure. And she looked at the title and said, rich kid. Mm. I, she, she said something to the lines of like, um, I don't think I want my kids to be reading such books about rich kids, you know, like, like just because of that title, you know, oh. she feels that rich kids are rich kids are snobby, arrogant, and she said, I don't want my kids to be like having this kind of thought, like 
being rich and everything. So I mean, she has not even read the content yet. So I mm. I do get this kind of criticism, and I tell her that like, oh, just 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 take it as a light reading. It's not meant to be serious. It's supposed to be chillax. It's supposed to be for you to relax. And basically, rich kids not about rich kids. It's about their their adventure all around the world. They go to the Bahamas. They go to a road trip in Sar- Sarawak and everything. So. Those characters are a mix of rich kids and non-rich kids. So, so rich is just a title. It's just so I was tell her not to, not to really take life so seriously. You know, not everything has to be taken at point value. So, so yeah, I do get criticism, and also when I get those good responses, like wow, your story really made my day. I'm so happy that you make me laugh. I it really made my day as an author, and it really made me want to write more. So, so yeah. So I I guess as authors, we cannot escape from criticism. We have to exactly. sort of learn to have thick skin in this industry. Yeah. Okay. On that, yeah, we have to <laughs> never <laughs> like. Just, okay, yeah. I've actually never like been out as an author yet. That does not make sense. Uh, basically, I've always been like marketing digitally because the only like event that I was supposed to go to was PBKL, uh, Pesta Buku Kuala Lumpur last year but then oh, the yes, pandemic yes. i was invited yeah. i was invited also we have, oh we have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and then and then that was about it i never like met my readers face to face except for that one time i i met someone in mph which you know uh kind of like gives you like that nice feeling of like hey someone's reading my book and Aww. loved it and uh but that's about it. I've never met like a reader. I never done like signings or anything. Only like sent signed books to people. But I think to some extent it has protected me from like your accident just now. Like someone like meeting me and being like, "Oh, this book is bad," or like because <laughs> most of my reviews have been from people who actually read like for fun and like are part of the like the bookstagram or the booktube community. And it's very niche, but it's a full of people who are really passionate about it and full of like really nice people like really really nice people so yeah and i'm really grateful for that maybe there's like a silver lining to the pandemic Whoa. like at least one thing right so yeah yeah, yeah i know I, I was i was supposed also to go to, to go dbkl last uh, last year but because of the pandemic it was cancelled i was already on the program that invited me or was my name was on the list already and when they say oh i'm sorry we have to postpone it because of the Pandemic, the MCO was like, oh, bummer. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but anyway, I took that time to write my third book. So, silver lining. Hey. <laughs> okay, now I'm I going to. Fun. Yeah, so I'm going on to move on to the quotes. Um, uh, the quotes from y'all. Right. I'll start with with Adida first. Okay, we saw, we all saw the cake that was posted on Instagram. <laughs> I think people who who are following you will know what I'm talking about. Tell us more about how did that all minds are broken cake came about. It looks so like like an art that you kind of want to eat it. You want to put it in a museum of art. So I mean, yeah, how did it come about? I had nothing to do with it, so I should not take any credit because it was uh, my it was my parents and my sister, my family essentially, who were like, oh my god, it's like one year. And I, I was like being super excited about it because I was like, oh my god, I'm not turning one year old. A baby is turning one year old. Ooh. So like I wanted to like give away and like I was talking to them about it and I didn't know that they were like, like actually taking it seriously. So they were <laughs> and they did a whole like video where my friends, my friends are all like super sentimental. I love them for it. And they did like this whole like 10 minute video of my really, really close friends and family just saying congratulations and reading excerpts from my book. Wow. Yeah, at my wow. family, I'm very like, like me. We love doing sappy things. I love them for it. <laughs> um, and great. there was a kid. That's and there great. was a kid. The cover on it, which really, really nice. Because I've technically, I'm, I have a twin sister. So I technically never had like my own birthday. So that was oh. like my first, my cake. Which, you know. Yeah, your like own it, identity. Your own identity. First time, like your own. Your you don't have to share. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then there's one you posted. Um, you say that there are some perks of living in a small town. Not getting to see your own book on bookshelves long after its release is definitely not one of them. I finally got to do just that this week. It really does mean the world. So can you tell us 
when you saw your first book on bookshelves, how was that feeling like for the first time when you saw it? It's oh, it's it's a different kind of experience. I have you know, the long time I couldn't get to see my book was like months, almost a year, because I live wow. in a small town. Essentially, uh, I don't know Sri Manjung. Has anyone heard? Because whenever I tell people like where I'm from, I I'll go and say Sri Manjung Pera, and there have been on many occasions that people go like, ah, oh, mana tu? Uh, it's because <laughs> it <laughs> it's like. Between two different places, like if I say I'm from Lumut, more people will know. I think you guys know where Lumut is, and then if they still don't know where Lumut is, I have to go like, oh, like the beaches in Pira, the p- pantai tu, and then they're like, oh, okay, and yeah, basically we only have uh one popular here, and my book isn't being sold at popular, so my book isn't being sold where I live. We mostly have like stationary bookstores, uh. Yeah, and that's about it. So I couldn't really have the opportunity to see my book long after it's been published. So that was a bit of a bummer. The thing is, my kampung, so where I go to for holidays, is in KL. Wow. <laughs> Good thing is, <laughs> I don't have. There's no problem with traffic, you know, because like the jams are like on the way to all the kampung area, and I'm going to KL. So. That's a good thing. <laughs> so whenever I go balik kampung, I will go to the bookstore, and for the first time ever, I saw my personal book there, and it just—I don't know—it's it's the kind of feeling that you can't really explain. You just feel like, oh my god, I did that. So that was really, really nice. Yeah. What, what, the, one of the reasons why I wanted to ask you this question and why I choose this quote is that because I also felt what you felt when my first book was published ah、uh, ten years ago, Zany Zombie. I remember I was like crazy, like. What? You know, like, like I was like running to the bookstore and I was like, oh my god, Zany Zombie, where is it? You know, I was that feeling that I had, I could still sort of remember and recall, and that's why I was asking you this question because I believe that every one of us also went through that phase as well. So it's a very nice. I think at Fatin, I think you also did you go through this kind of phase, like not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I'm、But、just basking、well. in your 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 excitement, rubbing yeah, yeah. it off. You well, you well, <laughs> believe in that, you well. Okay, let me go to the next one that、um, Adelia spoke. Then we'll go to the other one. So this one you say, Adelia, you say that whatever you want to do, go for it. It may seem impossible now, but when you actually achieve it, you realize that not many things are actually impossible. I promise. So this quote is something that is very personal to me as well.、Um, what was the things that tiny things or the big things that actually led you to this moment? That when you wanted to say this quote, I guess it's it's been a journey. It's been a journey. It's because ever since I was little, that's basically all I wanted to do. My cut kosong kosong satu was different from other people because I wanted to be. Ah,、uh, oh, this is so embarrassing. But basically, it was like pilihan satu penulis, pilihan dua pelukis, pilihan ketiga perdana menteri. I do not. I was a. <laughs> so like. It's always been that. Pilihan satu was always penulis. It was always gonna be like I was gonna write something because that was always what what was going to happen. And the fact that I've I've been able to do it now, at like relatively a young age compared to some people, I am like eternally grateful. It's it's been fun. It's been amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Because even I, I, I even when I saw my books on the shelf and. And I actually did quite well. I made my parents they're a rich kid. The first book did very well. Then that's why I was able to write the second book. And then I went to so many international schools and local schools in Malaysia, all across Malaysia. The experience was amazing. I never thought it would lead to that moment. So I believe in your quote strongly that it may seem possible now, but when you actually achieve it, you realize that actually everything is achievable when you put your mind to it. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. That's why I love this quote. Okay. Now I'm going to your quote, Fatin.、Uh, can you give me a second? Just give me a second. Give me a second. Okay. Fatin. <laughs> <laughs> your story actually inspires me because you're so young and you didn't give up. Oh. It Aww, just it just、All、makes、right. me wish that oh I wish I didn't give up. <laughs> you did it. You did it. So proud of you. Okay. Are you guys ready for the? Okay, this is your、oh, quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you say this is how I cope with people incapable of giving me closure. Sometimes 
I write the people into non-existence until I forget their real name. Because real people can be evil, and you can never understand why in the end, while my characters were mine. Okay, what struck me about this quote is that we all deal with this on almost like maybe a daily basis or a regular basis. We deal with forgiveness. Like, I think this is something that we all have. Um, different people react to forgiveness in a different way. So how do you define forgiveness in your own terms? How do you define that? Um, I think my definition of forgiveness, like it changes from time to time. But for now, I think forgiveness is more about you finding your own peace. It's more about making it about you instead of that person who hurts you because yeah, some people might argue that, you know, you don't have to forgive people. It's fine. It's your right. Yeah, it's also your right to forgive people and find your own peace. And I, is it bad that I don't remember where, when I wrote that quote? I don't remember when I wrote that quote. But my point is, um, the thing um, I'm more focused on, when I write, I tend to write things that actually give me closure do things that I didn't have the chance to actually end with peace in life because I don't know I tend to have like a lot of incidents in the past that I still have no answers um, for so that's why I write in a way if because you know when you write fictional things you could make that person who hurt you into fictional characters and you you could do whatever you want with them you could make them into a good person even though they're not they're not a good person in real life and in a way you could you could make yourself forgive them and the point is you just want the peace it's not about them it doesn't matter if they're sorry or not for me because i feel like forgiveness give me peace and if i have to do it even if they don't deserve it i'll do it for myself so i think that's my sort of my definition of forgiveness for I, now like i, I like how you, you say that closure. forgiveness is not about it's not about that person but it's actually about yeah. you i i really yeah believe in that. I also actually struggled with forgiveness for a very long time. Um, I was trying to find my definition of forgiveness and I finally have it. But but before I want before I say that I will like to maybe go to Adelia. Uh, do you have you ever come across situations in life where you find that forgiveness um, is is a very difficult thing to you know is is part of your life and what are the how do you define it in your own way? Like how, how do you define your own terms? Okay, uh, I think to some extent, I I do believe in the forgive and forget whole thing, right? But I I find it harder to forget. I forgive really, really easily. Uh, as long as someone comes and forgives me and understands that they've done something wrong, instantly I just go, yeah, I forgive you because I understand that, you know, everyone's human, everyone makes mistakes. But as someone who uses like creative outlets to, you know, like understand my personal emotions i rarely forget and i take that to heart but i find a way to take those things and help myself become a better person through it so i don't really forget i think it's good to remember all the things because you remember and understand how people are when they're at their worst and when they're at their best so forgive forget is a different thing yeah what doesn't kill you make you stronger I mean, what doesn't kill make you stronger? It makes you stronger. The, the memories will make you stronger as a person. Um, for me, when I was, for me when I was young, I always thought that forgiveness is about okay, that person did a bad thing, and you you forgive and you you smile on that person, and everything's okay, sunshine. Okay, that was what I thought in the past. And you you forgiveness also means that you be kind with that person, and you uh, you say everything's okay. But what I learned, uh, what I really learned about forgiveness is is that it's okay to say that it's not okay. Like that person who hurt you or whatever in, in the past, it's okay, mm -hmm. uh, it's okay to say it's not okay. That, that I don't think that, that what he did is okay. In, the, in the previous, the pre my previous way of thinking is that, uh, okay, I forgive him, it's okay. What he does, it's okay. You know, it's okay because I, I forgive him. But now I come to this kind of pers perspective that what he did is not okay. It's not okay, but I forgive him. So forgiveness to me really means that you're willing to know that that thing has happened to you and what are you going to do about it from this point onward? What are you going to do about it? I'm not saying that I'm, I'm okay that person doing it. I'm not saying that I'm happy 
I'm not saying that I'm, oh, I'm going to that person's house and shake hands. Um, no. Forgiveness to me, it means that I have, I acknowledge it has happened and I am going to, what I'm going to do about it. So I'm going to do something that is not going to keep me in bondage, like in chains. Because if you, if you think about it, um, we always tend to think that uh, forgiveness is always give us, give us like this kind of like, um, we are, we are, in, we are, we are chained up like a prisoner, like, you know, in all that, that, that thoughts and everything. But for me is that when I, when I was able to say that, that thing is not okay, but I am able to sort of move on from now, what I'm going to do about it? So that is, that is the big, big question. So yeah, so for me, forgiveness has already evolved in, in such a way that has changed my life completely. So when I say forgive someone, it doesn't mean that I'm going to shake that person's hand, I'm going to invite him to my house for tea. It's not that, I will, I will not do that, but I forgive him, meaning that I'm doing it for myself. I'm, from this point onward, it's what about I'm going to do for myself. So it's for on my own, for myself, not for that person. So forgiveness is about yourself and not that person. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you are going to, you know, go to that person's house and quarrel or whatever, yeah. you know, you just, that's very strong. I, 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 that's, why, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this because I feel this is something that all of us can sort of um, relate to in one way or another. So yeah, that's a very strong quote and I, I really, really um, empathize that. Uh, okay, the next one, the next, the last quote that I got is that this one, this is an appreciation post for the people who supported me from day one. The people who offered to read my notebooks at the back of the room and told me how much they liked my story. The ones who believed me when I didn't. The ones who went out of their way to show their support, never failing. Now this quote, I think is a very, it's a very affecting quote. Who was that person you think in your life, Patin, that kept you going? Who was that person who believed in you? Yeah. Mm, I think when it comes to writing, it had always been a very lonely thing for me, but not lonely. It's more of something that I go through alone instead of with people. But when it comes to sharing my writings, it's something that I share with people that, um, uh, that see that see it as something valuable because sometimes you write but you're not you're not the person that's able to see the value of it so you need these people i think for me it's more to my family well the things i write that i write my family don't actually get because they don't actually prefer um reading in english so sometimes i do feel lonely but i they're my biggest supporters and when it comes to that question i I automatically think of my mom, my my mom and dad, because um, I think the self-published book was, I think first, at first, I did it for fun, and they were the one who see the potential of it, and then they said that I should, I should print more and sell it more, and that they had always seen, you know, parents, they, they had always seen the things that you couldn't see in yourself, even when, yeah, even when you couldn't see it. I think, yeah, the safe answer and the, the true answer is my family. Even though I do have like friends that I could never treat for anything, like the, the the people that you know, when I was just I was a nobody, I didn't have any following, and I had been rejected by publishers. They still want to read my book. I mean, that's that's unreal. That's still unreal to me, and I still remember their names. And yeah, I I hope I appreciate them them enough, and I know I can never repay them back. So yeah, it means yeah. a lot. Sometimes, to me. sometimes you know, you only just need one person. Like some people always think that oh, you need like 100 people or 200 people to support you. Sometimes you just only need, need one person to keep you going. And that's very important. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I heard this quote, um, Lady Gaga. She was saying something <laughs> like, um, regarding her movie, uh, A Star is Born, she was say saying something along the lines of like, uh, if there are 100 person in a room and only one person who believes in you, that really matters. So, so I really believe, I agree with that. So it doesn't, so in a room of 100 people, 200 people, 300 people, as long as you have just one person who is willing to support you, that makes the whole difference. And it really made the difference in her movie. And it also applies to our lives as well. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, my book, my sister was the cheerleader. She was the cheerleader. She was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, pom, 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 the cheerleader. 
So she supported me, and that's, I think she is very instrumental in, in why my book was published. So I think oh. I'm very grateful for her support, her, her time, her help. Um, I don't know about you, Adelia. Do you, do you have anyone that really supported you that you want to give credit to? Definitely. My, you know, like the acknowledgements part of my book, it's basically just me thanking people. It's not, it's just people. I won't be here without them at all. Obviously my twin sister, is basically my, my rock, my, like my number one fan. She's the one person who reads everything first. She is like the, the layer of before editors, before anyone, she's the number one. Okay. If I, if I get, let anyone else read it first, she's going to get me. She's the number one. Okay. So like she's the supporter. It's always her first. And like we care everything. So my stories definitely go to her number one. And then my parents obviously wouldn't be here without them 100%. And yeah, my friends obviously, basically everyone who was part of the whole cake thing, they've been there since day one. So really, really wouldn't be here without them. And, and actually I can relate to what uh, Patin said basically about, you know, sharing stories in the classroom. I did that a lot too. In the back of the class, we would have like these sessions where we would exchange stories and some people would exchange stories that they read, exchange stories that they heard from TV and I would exchange stories that I personally wrote and they've been there since day one and I couldn't be here without them. Yeah. I was like you, Adila, when I was in school. I remember I was in the back of the class. The teacher was saying something I was yawning and I was like, oh, and then I just started writing stories and poetry. Yeah, I was, I was like that. I was like, okay, do you want to read my poetry? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, on that note, uh, my, my sister was instrumental, but my family supported me. But I would say that if it, the most instrumental would be my sister. So I would say you just need one person. But my family also supported in, in that sense. In that sense. Okay, now I'm moving on to the last section before we wrap, wrap it up. So I'm going to talk about the, the, the big thing, which is the pandemic that is affecting every single one of us on this earth, which is something that we can't run away from. Now, this pandemic and this MCO has been imposed for almost more than a year. It has been almost more than a year. Um, I know that it's affecting all of us in a lot of ways, like our mental health, you know, even me, because previously before the pandemic, I was always out there in the school, like the school visits as an author visit. I've done quite a lot and book signings. I, I miss that, to be honest with you. Um, uh, okay, but but we always try to look for the silver lining in everything. So what have you learned? What has the pandemic actually taught us? What do you think is the lesson that we can sort of glean from the pandemic? So maybe I start with um, Adidia. Sure. Uh, okay. I guess this is less like book stuff, book related and more like life in general. Because yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to be like in my like leaving home, going to... <laughs> uni and like you know I guess doing something while I don't know like kind of phase in my life and that's kind of been stripped away a little bit I got to stay on campus for like a few months and then I had to go back home and it's been great getting to meet new people actually studying something I enjoy which is like more English centric and less science stuff that I had to go through during secondary school and like it's been a great experience, but the pandemic has cut it short and we had to do online classes, basically. So it's very cliche, but it's that you have to take in the experiences in your life and be grateful for them. And just like the little things, you know, getting to like dine out, getting to meet your friends, getting yes, to agree. You know, just, just take in those experiences and like look at them for what they are. Really, really like, great opportunities rather than just like your everyday life it's really really yeah that's what i've got then essentially yeah the, also so actually there's actually good things also that come from the pandemic not everything is bad and how about you fatin what did you learn from this pandemic what good has it come up from this pandemic i know there's a lot of bad things but we want to look at the good good things what has it taught you yeah um i think um it's more of a realization that um, staying at home all the time is not always healthy because, you know, I used to be like the kind of introvert that used to complain because uh, every time I have to go out of, of my house and it's sort of when you when you are forced into the thing that you act, you think that you like, you actually like, it's you realize that you actually, what you like is not always the best for you. I think it's more of like, 
um, the good the good thing about the pandemic is the epiphanies that come with you know staying at home and home and like having to having like too many time too many like free time to think and i i think one of the silver is also joining uh the bookstagram community because i used to be so lonely uh reading books on my own and then i joined the community and i i didn't stay for long but i actually mm-hmm. liked how I, ha- i actually gained friends and i learned that you know when you 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 can't complain that you don't have friends that have the same interest as you but actually you can go out there and find them instead of just complaining about it that's what one one of the things that i learned yeah that's good that's good everybody has silver lining my silver lining for this pandemic is gratitude like i learned to be more grateful for the small things just like what they just say small things um like you know last time we used to take things for granted like going out like you know we will complain like this is not going the way we want but now you sort of look at things and oh i even going out for a, for a walk is 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 gratitude i'm grateful for that like taking a a breath of air you know fresh air outside is is great so it really changes you in that way you think more and you are more grateful for the, the small things and and you don't take things for granted as much as you did in the past So I think that's one is for lining and also I took this period of my time to write my book. So I I wrote quite I wrote quite fast the the third book for my Dear Rich Kid. So so I, there was a lot of like like self contemplation and a lot of things going on. So it's a there's a super lining of this pandemic. And moving on, um this is a very big topic. I I had this I did this interview uh, a couple of weeks ago with one of the life coach from Germany. His name is Mark Burnett. We were talking about staying strong through the pandemic, and we, 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 I was, the reason I want to do this is because I know this is affecting all of us mental health, which is a crisis right now. It's not just a thing, but it's really a worldwide crisis, and we're all going through this pandemic with this in mind. I believe everyone's going through this. Um, so I want to know what have you guys done during this pandemic for the sake of your mental health? Maybe we we'll start with you, uh, Fatin. What did you do? Mm-hmm. I think it's more of, yeah. Yeah. Um, what did I do? I think it's more of like uh, taking care of myself that I do not exert myself too much on social media because I think social media plays a huge role in making in exhausting me because I am an introvert. I I um and when I socialize too much. I tend to feel exhausted and it affects my mental health. But and on social media, you tend to not notice this, notice it because you're at home. You're at home and you're just on your phone. You feel like you're alone, but actually not. When you're on social media, you're actually talking to to people and it's taking um a lot of energy. So what I did for my mental health is I settled boundaries to myself, and I. I cannot let anyone cross that boundary or let myself cross that boundary. So, I had made hard decisions, um, but I think it's important to, you know, maintain that boundaries for my mental health. And one of it is like leaving the Bookstagram community. I actually, I, I haven't left, but I, I think that even though being in a community is important, I feel like I couldn't handle it, and I have to make hard choices, choices for myself. So that's one of the things that. I did for my mental health. I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned that because I I do I do uh, I do see that there are some books to gram us. They're actually uh, deactivating the account. Like they 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 need a social media break. You know, which yeah. is understood, which is good. You need that. Sometimes you need to say learn to say no. I mean, mm-hmm. you need to learn to say no. I need a break. That's fine. That's yeah. Okay. So yeah. So once like I get tired of this doing this um maybe this interview. I I've, I've done this quite quite a long time already for a couple. So many months, you know. So I'm quite liking it. So once I feel I don't feel that connection anymore, I will sort of say, take a break. But but at this moment, if I don't feel that yet, I will go on. So it's you have to also listen to your body and listen to 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 your voice. Whether should I do this? If you you think it's not right, you should just stop it immediately. So yeah. And how about you, Adelia? What did you do for your mental health? I actually didn't do. I didn't like actively do anything because I. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because like currently, I just finished my foundation studies, uh, waiting for my degree result. So I am very like life is pretty vacant right now. Like I can't leave the house. I'm basically just at home, not doing much, and I'm doing it 
spending time doing the things that I love basically so if that's one thing that I'm doing it's doing that it's writing reading just taking the time and doing whatever I want that doesn't necessarily include like going out or seeing people and I've always been like a pretty you know a homebody like I love staying at home and doing things like watching movies and reading so it's been pretty good and i have a lot of privilege to say like spend the pandemic in that way while a lot of people don't really have that privilege to you know stay at home and not do anything and just like relax so yeah really grateful for that yeah i i think that for pandemic uh one of the things that because we really can't go out during mco period you cannot like go travel so you have to be i think mostly confined at home So most of the time I I would think that okay watching Netflix watching my favorite drama series for a long term is is going to help me you know like sort of like people usually watch movies to relax but I find that if you watch too much of it you can also affect your mental health like you over saturated over watching it your your brain just goes into an overload so sometimes I don't I don't do I don't binge too much I will just go out for a walk in the park that actually significantly helps to for my mental health because when you go to the park you are connecting with nature you are being in the present moment and i always do that i usually go for a walk in the park almost like every day so maybe do the three times a day like maybe today i'll skip it of course because i'm doing this interview with you guys today I'll, but, but tomorrow i'll be going out for a walk in the park for jog- jogging in the park so i'll I'll turn it. so that's how that's what i do for my mental health and i do some writing once in a while i don't write every day i i write once in a while so have learning to find the balance in all of these things it really helps for me okay um we almost to towards the last question last three questions uh did the pandemic affect your, both of you your writings in any way did it affect i guess the yeah. way you write or yes. how you write it yeah i i think yes but in a way that it pushed me to start writing again because i didn't think i would take my old manuscript and write again but yeah i think that's what changed for me uh, how about you adelia i guess uh before this i had like more of a structured like timetable but now since i have more like free time because i i'm basically at home not doing anything else so like my main thing right now is getting that book done uh it's given me more time obviously to focus on it but it's also given me like less of a like a structured way so i if i lay around i'm not going to write it so that's probably it's been affecting like my time management but you know i'm currently in like vacation technically like my break time so i'm relaxing taking my time with it so that's where i'm at right now especially during the pandemic the only like major thing the pandemic took was probably uh dbkl but yeah that's about it yeah i agree with you um the pandemic has affected like your sense of time zone do you realize that like, yeah. i don't know i don't know for for fatin but i i agree with uh, adelia because when you have the pandemic you have like your time sense seems to be tortured a bit i i don't know for fatin is that true but for for me in a way it did affect but i try to find um the positive in it yeah and sometimes i do write at night because find writing at night is very calming but sometimes it's not so good to always write so much at night because yeah you, you get to sleep very late but then you know yeah and you can't go out so you sort of confined at home most of the time okay uh okay let's take a question from all the viewers uh uh Mar- mariam says that if you're able to time travel would you visit your past self or the future you okay any one of you like to start first i would visit my past self and you know give her a hug and leave that's okay. all <laughs> adelia how about you past self honestly see <laughs> because yeah. the thing is uh, i'm like a stickler for time travel movies you know sci-fi i i love time travel movies so and usually the the one thing that all these movies have in common is basically don't time travel like all of them basically you can time travel because it's going to break something in the multiverse something like that because you're not supposed to if you go into the future you're going to get worried and have anxiety about what's going to happen and you're going to try to change something if you go in the past you're going to try to change something you regret or like uh you know change something that you wish didn't happen and to be honest even like the bad and the good i think everything have i believe everything happens for a reason so 
yeah, I would probably do something like go back and probably appear in some dream or something and be like, hey, you're doing good. Yeah, that's about it. Okay, in regards to that question, I think it makes more sense for me to, tra- to travel to my past self instead of my future self. Because your future is always shaped by what you, you have done in the past. Am I correct? So, so, yeah. so it makes more sense. If you were to travel to the future, how are you going to give advice so that you won't make the same recurring mistake? So for me, I guess I will visit my past self, like give some like great advice, like, you know, this is, you should have done this years ago and this, you should follow your passion and, you know. So yeah, I, I guess I will travel my past self, definitely. Okay, the last two questions before we wrap this wonderful um, conversation up. Um, what would you say to your younger self? Okay, Adelia, what would you say to your younger self? And the same thing, like on the lines of, hey, you got this, like, don't give up. It's okay. And also, like, take your time with it. It's okay. You're young. Chill. <laughs> you can do all the things you put your mind to. Just, like, take a breather. It's okay. And spend time with all the people that you love because who knows, the pandemic might happen, you know? <laughs> okay, great. Great advice. How about, how about you, uh, Fatin? Um... I think I just, I just share the same uh, advice uh, with Adelia. Like I said, I would give her a hug and I would just tell her that she's doing okay and she just stop overthinking about it and just do it. Whatever she wants to do, just do it. Stop thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I think I also have on, on the same wavelength with you guys. Uh, for my my self, I'll just say that um, everything, don't worry, be happy. Even though when you feel like you're hit by a ton of bricks, know that everything will be okay. Because I think the the I always believe in the concept of the universe. Like you know, like they are always invested in your self actualization, and so so I believe that whatever things that happen back to you, like it feels like you know, like there's no way out. You're in this dark pit. Uh, there's you're always going to see the sun because even though it's raining and the thunderstorm is there, the sun is always out there. So I will tell I'll just say, don't worry be happy. Things are going to be okay. Okay. And then the last question, the last dun 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 dun, uh, is, <laughs> this, this is a book kind of thing. So what advice would you guys give to aspiring writers out there? What are the advice that you would give? Mm-hmm. Any one of you? Yeah. Hmm. I think I would tell them to, the same thing I would tell my past self, Stop overthinking it and just do it. If you don't write it, you won't know if it would become a thing. Just, yeah, stop thinking about it. Because I've yeah. had like a lot of questions of uh, people asking how and, you know, what to do. But they haven't tried it yet. And I think it's more of writing a book is more of like doing how do I say it? You write while thinking about it instead of thinking about it beforehand and then doing it because it's, it's a very personal process because it involves it involves thinking, it involves your feelings. So yeah, it's you have to think before, after. You won't stop thinking about it. So if you don't do it while thinking about it, you won't ever do it. Yeah, it's true. I agree with you. Like, don't overthink it. That's that's how I also live my life by. Don't overthink it. You know, in the past, I always have this that this that this and it becomes like a like a mountain like a mount everest <laughs> kind of thing so so don't overthink it I, I i believe that um yeah to all the writers out there don't overthink it and how about you adelia what from from yeah. all your experiences in life what was the advice that you can impart to to the writers out there it's yeah it's basically on the same wavelength yeah it's basically just do it just do it and yeah. most importantly listen to the discouraging voices like people who you know, would rather see you fail rather than succeed. Listen to the people who want you to succeed because you want to succeed. Listen to the people who actually want to see you do good and eventually it's gonna come true. Yeah. Are you guys working for Nike? <laughs> Just, <laughs> Just do it. Just do it. Okay. Best like nine. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, for me, I will. For the advice I will give is that uh, just follow your, follow your gut, like follow your instinct. Like, like some pe- some people, they want to be writer. Like, like okay, when, when I was young, I I remember that I wanted to become a an actor. Like I saw all the movies, all the cool movies. I said I want to be an actor. 
And then when American Idol or Malaysian Idol came out, oh, so cool! I want to be a singer. I want to sing, even though <laughs> I love singing or I love acting. Um, but somehow, but somehow, okay, I can I, I can sing, but I don't have a very good voice. Somehow, but it just does. But as as the time goes by, I just realized that that you, your passion is uh is something that's given to you when you are like it's gifted to you. So you will know it. So I I come to learn over the years that writing is actually my biggest passion over acting and writing. So actually, among during this time where singing acting is uh really is that、like、people are seeking for fame, for for it's a fame based kind of thing. People are seeking for fame. They just want to do that. So don't 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 think of the fame. Don't think of、uh, the fortune that comes along. Just think of what your your soul, your your, your Came here to do what? What? What you wanted to do in the in the first place? Don't don't、uh, overlook that. So my advice, my really strong advice is that just follow your gut instinct, your heart. If writing is for you, then you write. If if playing the piano or playing the football is something that strikes makes you happy, now okay. One thing that you can tell that you know is the right thing is that when you have the spark in your eyes. I I remember this very clearly. Clearly, when I was、uh, in the workforce, and I was in a meeting with a group of people, and it was so boring. They were talking about like 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 all the accounting stuff, the 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 ledger, the 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 years, like profits and everything.、It、was so boring. I my heart wanted to explode. And the minute one of the bosses said, "Um, talk talk about writing the writing segment," my eyes lit up. I didn't even know that. Then the boss looked at me and said, "Malcolm, do you know that your eyes just light up when I mention about writing?" I didn't know that. I can't even tell that my eyes were lighting up. And that was when I know that、um, sometimes the things that you love to do, you, you can't even know it because you have so many things that you want to do it, but you don't know what is the right thing. What is the right thing? So follow, follow your bliss, follow、mm-hmm. your passion, and follow what your heart really tells you. Only you know it. Nobody can tell it for you. So I think that is one of the strongest advice. So, so if you can feel the spark, then that that is the thing for you. That not everybody writes, not everybody acts, not everybody sings. So you know your lane. So yeah, I think that is one one of the strongest things I've learned. Got to learn. Yeah. So I hope you guys, you guys have fun today. I did. <laughs> I feel、yeah. so inspired. <laughs> I hope everybody has fun. Okay, if you guys have any questions, you may drop us. Because、uh, we're about to wrap this up, so I would like to thank、um, Adelia Khalid and Fatin Afrina again today for coming on board the first ever session of Otto's Pillows Talk, and I hope、yes. to have more of this in the future, so we can we can know more about Otto's books, not only their books but also their personal lives and their experiences、yeah. and the journey of what they're going through personally. I think people want to know that. I think people want to know that because. When people know what you go through, it really helps them as well because they can they can relate to that. So I'm really really happy today that you guys came on board, and I wish you all guys the best in your writing journey, and hope to see you guys more in the future. Yeah. No,、oh, I hope all the best for you guys too. <laughs> thank you, thank you so thank much. Thank you. And thank you all to our audience. You guys have any last words to say before we wrap it up? Wrap this up. Anything else you want to say? Like anything that. Okay, everybody has been talking so much. They want to drink some sprite right now. <laughs> okay, bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Time and you. I hope that you guys learn a lot of things today from from book writing, from what it means to be a writer, and from following your bliss and following your passion. And thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. Thank you, Anissa, Nizam. Bye. Yeah. Thanks for enjoying this. We enjoyed.